So, hey, Elizabeth, uh, it's great to talk to you. Great to uh, meet you kind of in person, somewhat over Zoom-ish, kind of. Uh, but uh, how are you doing? I'm doing doing well. It's spring. I saw the eclipse, you know. That's right. Yeah, I kind of, uh, I glimpsed it today, but, you know, I, I did want to blind myself by looking at it. Uh, couldn't really see too much, but it did seem up in New York. I was in New York today, uh, and it was kind of a weird, the light seemed a little slightly unworldly. It was, but um, neighbors gave us some of the glasses that you can look at it, and I was shocked. You could really see it. Oh, you could, you could see uh, it and watch it. Yeah, it was kind of beautiful. Yeah, well, I'm sure celestial bodies and all this stuff. I suppose all the uh, all the members of the Flat Earth Society are probably uh, scratching their heads right now. Well, they, I'm sure they think it's a hoax, but we don't have to worry about that. Yes, this is true. This is true. So you're in so you're in New York now, also. Uh, oh, I'm, well, I'm back in Philly tonight now, but uh, I think you're in New York City, right? I'm currently upstate um, in Red Hook near Bard College. Oh, I, I do still, I part of the time in Brooklyn and part of the time upstate, but I am currently upstate. And did you grow up in New York, or where where are you from originally? I am from a farm in Camden, Alabama, about okay. an hour south of Selma. Okay, wow. That's that's far. It's very far. It's very far. And uh, you went to you. I think you got a degree. Was it in flute originally at Juilliard, yes. or yeah. or what? So I I guess I mean I'm sure you're asked this all the time. So I I apologize. But what's the journey? Well, what's the journey from a small town in Alabama? How did you get from there up to? Uh, you know, teaching shakuhachi and theremin at uh, at Bard. How does that happen? Or how do you even discover the theremin or and or the shakuhachi? Uh, for people who don't know the shakuhachi is Japanese bamboo flute, uh, but you'll be playing theremin this summer. And we should actually at some point also discuss what a theremin is for people who don't. So it's a very long and involved story, but um. I'll just say there was always a door open. I started playing flute pretty late and just gradually ended up in New York, ended up at Juilliard. Um, and on an orchestra tour, you know, I started working as a professional flutist. I, that's been my main job throughout my career. Um, on an orchestra tour of Japan in 1982, I heard shakuhachi for the first time, and it was like the music in my head. It's, this is before I started writing music, and I just wanted to make the sound. And then in 1993, I saw a documentary about the life of Leon Theremin, the man who invented the theremin. And again, I heard the sound, and I thought, wow, it's, it's like the music in my head. I just, I really wanted to learn to play it, um, but I had no idea how to get one. And then quite a few years later, I went to a friend's concert and there was a theremin. And I said, where do you get it? And they said, oh, you just call 1-800-MOG-MUSIC and order one. So I did that and floundered around for a while. There's really no theremin pedagogy, or there wasn't then. And I managed, um, after a few years, to have two lessons, one each with a couple of good players who came through New York. And then I just kind of taught myself. But, and I became a composer somewhere along the way there too. But with both the theremin and the shakuhachi, I love the flute, but the music in my head is different. The, the sound world is very different. So there are things that the shakuhachi and the theremin can do that just felt like home to me. So, well, can you explain, uh, I, I suspect a lot of people don't know what a theremin is and how it works and, and what even what it sounds like. Well, everybody knows what it sounds like. If they would hear it, they would think, oh, that. So the sound everybody recognizes is the Beach Boys, Good Vibrations, the 
do, do, which is not really a theremin, but sounds like a theremin. So the theremin is the first electronic instrument, and it was invented in 1919 in Russia by Leon Theremin, who was a Russian military scientist, and he was working on border controls for the military. And he discovered that the human body could detune radio waves. And if people are old enough, I'm sorry, they can what, remember the human body can detune radio waves, like the old TVs with the rabbit ears. You, if you walked by them, ah, uh, yes, it would mess things up. So, I remember just I had one in my bedroom. I would hit it on the top all the time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. If you're really young, maybe you haven't experienced this, but Theremin was a cellist and he got this idea that he could invent an instrument that would free the player from all physical constraints, which is not true with the theremin at all, but that's his idea. So it's, like I said, an electronic instrument. It's got two, um, two antennas. There's a pitch antenna and a volume antenna and each Antenna has two sets of radio waves, a fixed wave and a movable wave that you're interfering with. And what you hear is the difference tone in, you know, in numbers and in, in vibrations. So um, this is the volume. Can you see both my hands? Yes. So I should have had my theremin in here. It's out there. But I'm going to play play. Do, 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 do. So <laughs> it's kind of a violinist friend who plays there and says it's like turning your instrument over. But if you're a string player, you can kind of imagine the positions. So you just, you're not touching anything, but it feels like you're touching the sound. And well, that's the thing I think is going to be very strange for people to understand that at no point are you in physical contact with the instrument, right? No, but it's, think about it, you know, if you sing, you can just kind of sing, you, you're not touching anything really. So what you do on the theremin is you find that first note, which is not always in the same place, and then you go from there. So you can play things, anything that you could sing, you can play. So you're kind of making a glissando between the pitches. I mean, you can't just pick out you know, a note and know where it's going to be. So mostly we find we have a, a speaker really close to our head and then you find that first note really, really quietly. And then you come in like you knew where it was. Oh. So I usually let the audience members try it. Uh huh. Yeah, I, it's. Yeah, it's just hard to hard to process it. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of dying to try one. I've never, I've never tried one. Well, you're going to have your chance and it's easier than the viola. <laughs> oh, okay. Much easier than the viola. Now, Theremin had quite uh, an interesting story. I, I, I've heard of that documentary. I've been dying to see it. I haven't seen it yet. Um, I'm assuming that's the one that you're referring to. Yeah. Um, and I, I recall hearing some story there was a controversy possible rumor that he had been he'd come to the u.s and then he'd been kidnapped by the the kgb or the precursor to the kgb but then he found his way back to the u.s after decades or or what what's the what's the scoop on that there but there's a lot it's really a lot more complicated than that so he initially came over voluntarily um and he was promoting his instrument but was he a spy yes he had to be everybody had to be you know there's that that great seal in the oval office that was discovered to have microphones in it at some point way back when he made that so um at a certain point he went back voluntarily i mean he he believed in the soviet cause but when he went back he was sent to the gulag where he spent many years hmm. and then 
when he was why there. why was he sent why was he sent there because they thought he was a double spy or something i mean why is anybody over there persecuted sure. i mean <laughs> um who knows it reminds me of prokofiev right going back willingly yeah so expecting that you know things had changed and would be okay and then never being able to leave again you know artists are idealists too and you know i who knows there's a great biography of theremin if you're a reader by albert glinsky who he was my classmate but um it's a really great book because theremin lived he lived throughout the 20th century and he lived through communism capitalism the world wars the cold war glasnost and he lived through everything and he was part of just he was really involved in all these different political movements and toward the end of his life somebody now i'm forgetting exactly who found him and he he did get to come back you know when he was quite old but he was li just living living in russia kind of as a poor elderly man hmm. so nobody knew where he was for a long long time including you know he married here and his wife didn't know where he was so oh, you mean he just like didn't come home one day and something yeah uh. Did I'll brush they... up on it before I come up there. So I, I should have reread the whole book before I had this interview to really have it at the tip of my fingers. <laughs> I'm wondering if they, uh, you know, the romantic soul in me wants to know whether they reunited after, you know, 20 or 30 years. No, I don't think so. There's the woman who he married who was a dancer, but his muse was um, Clara Rockmore, who was a violinist, you know, who, um, and Nadia Reisenberg's sister. If you, that's probably before your time at Juilliard. Um, so Clara Rockmore was a concert violinist who you know, injured her hands, and she started. She was the first classical thereminist. Oh. She's still the one that everybody, you know, we all have her recordings and everything. But she played it like a violinist, and she concertized. Extensively with her sister Nadia Reisenberg, who was still at Juilliard when I was there. Although at that point, I had no idea what a theremin was. Uh, so opinion. has there? I mean, you talk about violin, and there's this entire, you know, there's centuries of pedagogical technique. Uh, and you alluded to earlier that there there wasn't for the theremin, or or maybe there was just so, the beginning of some. I mean, are there are there you know are there uh, you know, Kreutzer etudes, are there exercises for <gasps> theremin, Andrzejczyk shifting exercises, or, you know, there seven, are. Yeah. yeah, so Clara Rockmore has a little book. Um, it tells you what to play, not how to play it. And there, um, there are two people, they're both in, in Europe, who are, you know, teaching, who are the main theremin teachers in the world now. One is um, Lydia Kavina, who's theremin's niece. And she's also a composer. And then, um, why am I blanking on her name? There's a, a German woman who's excellent. She was in New York for a while, but she's gone back. And she actually has her own pedagogy and a book. I, I'm so sorry I'm blanking on her name. Carolina Eich. Okay. And they're, they're really involved in teaching and technique. And, and also, Moog Music has... Um, well, since Robert Moog died, they're, they have some, they've made something called a theremini. To me, it's not a or theremini. To me, it's not really a theremin. It's kind of a toy. Mm. You can set it so it's not analog. You can set it so instead of going, it goes, and you, you can do that with it. And there are workshops for people who want to play those. I see. Well, that's interesting because I think of the 20th century and in in string technique, um, you know, you got uh, Schoenberg and and Berg and Bartok kind of pushing the instruments uh, to to new places. Technically, uh, you get extended techniques, and of course, the instruments actually change themselves also uh, to a certain extent. But are there? I mean. I imagine there must be 
extended techniques on the theremin that haven't been done before or or well there there are all these different ways to play i mean you can hook it up to midi and so there are people doing that you can play it gesturally you know you can just walk by it and go Mrow! and <laughs> you know it, it it doesn't care if you have no technique it just responds to people or you know animals actually dogs and cats can, mm -hmm. can play the theremin but there are people doing all kinds Wait, dogs of and cats can uh, if they walk by it it'll play yeah i mean it's i mean do they i've seen you know parrots playing the piano or something do are there any youtube videos of a dog playing the theremin or there's a cat playing a toy theremin which at least a hundred people have sent me okay video sure. of it's a little tiny one and the cat's kind of doing this to it and it goes wow wow so yeah there's that um i'm playing theremin in a pretty conservative way though i just basically want to sound like a something between a string and a voice i think so i'm yeah i don't know that i'm extended technique i have no idea you know you take a, a jar of water or something and you know messes with the waves or no it, it doesn't work like that it's just it's proximity and mass yeah. so i wrote a piece many years ago where I used an iron cover, covered in aluminum foil, and it was just basically an extension of my hand. So that would work, or you know, a, a metal pole, you could play it with that, but it's still connected to you electrically. And you'll you'll see when you get to play it. Right. Well, I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah. So are there other uh do you do you come from a musical background, your family down in Alabama or? Uh, you're, no, I'm, I'm guessing actually, you're the first theremin player in your family. My, I have one brother who's an organist and musicologist in New York City, and the rest of the family um, is farmers have, for generations. So my, my New York brother and I, I think we were just given to the wrong family. They have no idea <laughs> what to make of us. So. Well, so if you... If you weren't doing music, uh, do you think you would have been a farmer or? or uh... I would, I mean, nobody of my generation wants to be, I mean, you can't be a farmer. I mean, it's it just, it's not, all my relatives lost their farms. You know, you can't be a small family farmer anymore. Or actually new ones are starting up, but I, I kind of got over that. But the minute I had a little dirt, I garden very extensively. A lot of it's flowers. You know, I'm not gonna be canning any vegetables. I'm done with that. But um, yeah, I'm a pretty avid gardener. I have a plant cart of all kinds of seedlings that I have been starting since January. Um, I read, I love to cook. I'm a bird watcher, but I don't, in terms of, of a profession, nothing has come close to music for me mm. I mean, that's i i just can't imagine what i would have done when i was a little kid i wanted to be a veterinarian but i realized i couldn't stand to see animals in pain but that's so that i got rid of that my father was a, a large animal vet not officially i mean he was a farmer but he was the unofficial large animal vet for the area so um, the did you grow up with livestock or uh, yeah, cows, horses, goats, cows, horses, sheep? So it was it was a farm that was part of the extension service. So it was a working farm, but um, there were experiments done, like with you know fertilizer types of cattle feed, different crops, pesticides, all that. But um, yeah, it was just it was a farm mainly beef cattle hogs and um the kind of crops that they were promoting in alabama then they're trying to get away from cotton um and peanuts were a different part of alabama so there were a lot of soybeans um, my father couldn't believe that i ate them um, because to him they were cattle feed um, 
but yeah, just all kinds of crops. We had sheep for a short time, but it was just too hot down there. Mm -hmm. And um, I lived in a, the house that I grew up in was in a pecan orchard, but it just kind of happened to be there. It wasn't, you know, built as a, the, the pecan orchard dated us living there. So how did you, how did this little farmer kid start playing the flute and then, I mean, and I mean, that's, uh, it sounds like maybe you weren't surrounded by classical music, at least. No, not at all. Um, did a teacher in school, in, in elementary school or middle school, put one in your, in your hands or? No, I mean, this, it's kind of a long, tortuous path, but I just, the, the flute part, um, and it's a, the town near the farm was very small. And um, when I was in I don't know, fifth or sixth grade, seventh grade, was it later? Um, they built a dam on the Alabama River near us. And so a bunch of people moved to town and this girl moved to town who had a flute. And I think she was the first person I had ever heard play an instrument well, but I just, I heard it and I thought, oh, this is just the thing. And, you know, bugged my parents, bugged them, bugged them. And when I was 15, my mother, without asking my father, drove me to Selma and bought me a flute. Wow. So yeah, that was that was bad. It was a, a big a big crisis in the family. But um, I was a I was a National Merit Scholar, and with that, I got a um, was able to get a scholarship. I left school early. And I got into the University of Southern Mississippi, where I went for a year um, as a National Merit Scholar. Um, I really couldn't play at all. And when I was there, somebody said, oh, you should go self-taught, I suppose. I had two lessons with the man in Montgomery. But um, I mean, I couldn't really play. Yeah. I, I couldn't count. So at the University of Southern Mississippi, somebody said you should go north to a conservatory and somebody knew about the Cincinnati Conservatory and I sent them a cassette which I'm sure was awful and they took me and I went there and you know got better and then I went to New York there are a lot of other steps along along the way but um it just there was always a door open and I wanted to do it so badly I mm. really wanted to do it um there were a couple of records in the library in my town and I had them for many years because I they gave them to me because I was the only one that ever checked them out one was Glenn Gould playing the Goldberg variations hmm. the the original the early the recording. recording yeah and the other one as I remember it had Petrushka on one side and the Rite of Spring on the other side which is not possible but that's what I remember so Except for those pieces, I don't think I knew any classical music. Wow, that's quite a, you've got, you know, Goldberg on one end and you have, you know, groundbreaking, you know, riots in, in, in Paris on the other side there. Yeah, there were... I just, but I, and I did, I had some piano lessons as a child until the piano teacher quit teaching. Oh, um, yeah. And before we had a piano. What was your, you probably don't remember, what was your first reaction to hearing the Rite of Spring and Petrushka? It must have blown your, blown your, uh, your ears off there. All I can remember is that I couldn't play it if my parents were in the house. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I didn't have anything to compare it to, you know, church music. Um, field songs, I mean, there, there really wasn't anything else. So, mm. you know, this is way before computers or social media or anything. I mean, just, I, I wouldn't be competitive now. I, I don't know why anybody thought I had any talent, <laughs> but, um, you know, here I am. Well, was there, I mean, you mentioned field songs and church music, um, how, how present was was uh, 
you know, church music or folk music in in uh, in everyday life down there? Church music, you know, on Sundays, hymns, sing and hymns, stuff. And, and, uh, hymns and stuff. And you would hear, you know, I, I I've heard chain gangs sing. So, you know, and some of the men that worked on the farm sang. Sang while they were working. Yeah. You know, here and there, but I don't, there just wasn't much. My mother had a couple of Christmas albums and she had one album called Sing Along with Mitch, of which I still know all the songs, but they're not, they're not folk songs. I don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. Just songs. Hmm. So, um, do you, what, what kind of music do you listen to yourself now? Well, as a composer, what I love is to not have to listen to anything, which is difficult, um, you know, just to have space. I primarily listen to classical music unless I hear of, you know, or shakuhachi music, unless I hear of something else. Like Stephen Colbert um, interviewed Paul Simon a couple of weeks ago, and I just remembered all these songs I love. So, you know, for days I was listening to that. Um, I like all different kinds of music, but after, you know, 40 plus years of being a full-time working musician where I hardly ever had time to just like hear my own thoughts. I don't listen as much as I used to. Um, I try to go to friends concerts, of course. Um, I have a few CDs I love. I don't have Spotify or anything like that. Um, there are a few Actually, they're mostly piano, oddly enough. There are a couple of um, piano things. If I really, if I'm down and I, or, you know, feeling sorry for myself and I feel like I need to listen to something that reminds me that the world is bigger than my problems. Um, there are a couple of very specific things that I listen to for that. A couple of like the big things, the St. Matthew Passion, the first movement of the Symphony of Psalms, mm. I would say, um, and Mahler. Well, with the uh, Hallelujah, I believe, is that right? Symphony of Psalms, that those, yes. That yes. Crazy, those crazy chords right at the yeah. end, that they're so weird and they're so sublime at the same time. Yeah, weird. I think if, if there's a thing I am looking for in music, it's music that really moves you and you have no idea why. I don't want to know why. I want the magic there. And you don't you don't have to understand it, you know. If we understood it, everybody could write these masterpieces. Mm. And if I need something just more quiet, there are a couple of um Brahms intermezzi that I really love and they're on YouTube there are two different pianists playing them that there's Richter playing the the Brahms C major intermezzo and then um Radu Lupu playing the it's one of the E flat intermezzos I'll send you the links um okay great. but those two I don't get tired of but what I want is I want to listen to them all by themselves with nothing around them, nothing before or nothing after. I just wanted like <laughs> to wash everything else away and remember why I love music so much. That's mm. that's it for me. Yeah. It's interesting. Just uh just a few days ago I went to a, a concert. Um, you know, I'm going to concerts with some frequency, but it's it's difficult for me. This was a quartet concert, uh, uh the Quator Eben was playing French string quartet. And um, it's usually, honestly, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to go to concerts and, and kind of shut off the, the analytical part. I know, I know, and it's so, it's so like, well done. Oh, they could have done this or they could have done that or I didn't think that worked and, you know, and occasionally 
occasionally you'll go to a concert where, uh, and this concert was like that, the interpretation was, I mean, it was different than I would have played this music, but it was utterly convincing. Yeah. And, and within a few minutes, I was able to just say, you know, uh, I trust these guys and I'm just going to sit back and not, you know, just turn off that analytical part. And it's difficult and that's rare, uh, but it was such a, such a beautiful concert and it, boy, that, that really felt good, felt really good. It's so hard to turn off the analytical thing, but it's. Just, I'm just going to refer to both to something you said and to one of the pieces I said I like to listen to. I love this Brahms C major intermezzo. I mean, to me, it is what it's the sound of happiness. And, you know, in my head for years, I had this, you know, I can't play it, but I had this idea of it with a certain tempo. And then one day I was thinking, oh, I just really want to hear it. And so, you know, I Googled for videos of it on YouTube, and there was a mix of all these different pianists playing it. I thought, oh, I'll listen to it. And the one I loved was Richter, and it was so much slower than I ever imagined it. Hmm. But it just, it was so perfect. Hmm. So, yeah. And I have some neighbors upstate who are not musicians, but they're avid concert goers, and they're for me, they're the, the best years, you know, because they, if the music gets through to them, it gets through to them. And they think they know nothing. And I think, oh, they're the, really the ideal audience because yeah. they don't have to, they don't have to turn off what we have to turn off. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Elizabeth, I'm so excited uh, to work with you this summer. We have uh, Patrick Castillo writing this piece, 12 yes. microludes. Um, for theremin and string quartet based on 12 iconic birds in Newburyport with poems by Alfred Nicole and paintings by Jane Niebling. And you're a, you're a birder, a bird watcher also. So this, oh yeah, it's perfect. It's really perfect. So, uh, so looking forward to seeing you this summer and uh, to oh. with you. So thank you so much. Okay. Bye.